I'm Sam. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Kent, working with uh, Simon Thompson and Fred Barnes. Uh, so, sorry, this is going to be a little disorientating because I can't see what you can see here or there on my screen. But there we go. Um, right. So, my operating system is called Hydros, uh, after a hydra, you know, a single animal with many heads, is the idea. Uh, and this that you're looking at now is Hydros. This is an Erlang program that is the presentation running on the operating system. Um, yeah, the, the point of the operating system is to uh, withstand hardware and software faults. That's the general principle. And, and we do this by having one beam per core and allowing those cores to uh, talk to each other, but generally operate independently. Um, all the operating system services are written in Erlang, as well as the drivers, and it's built using a multi-kernel design. Yeah, so first I'm going to go through what the operating system is, how you can use it, how you probably shouldn't use it, um, and what multi-kernels are, and uh, how it works under the hood, so the sort of details of the system. And then we're going to go through some of the sort of other interesting features that it has. So the general project aim is to build an operating system that uh, will survive complete failure of the software as well as partial failure of the hardware. So that's things like uh, CPU cores failing to respond, uh, RAM failure, and peripherals, which is kind of easier, but still, yeah. Um, and the, the general idea here is that uh, if you have what would normally cause like a blue screen of death on Windows, then that'll only take down one of your nodes in your system. So if you have n cores, that'll take down one over n of your, uh, of your system's capabilities. So potential usage environments are basically anywhere that you can't get to a system easily to repair it. So uh, weather stations are a good example, or if someone's going to have to go in a canoe for four days to try and uh, repair the system, that sort of environment. And also space is another obvious one. So in space, you get lots of space dust flying around incredibly quickly, which might hit part of your system and knock out small parts, but not all of it. Um, yeah, and generally just uh, arenas where your hardware is likely to be damaged. Or, or areas where you want your system to uh, run without stopping for longer than the expected life of parts of the hardware in the system. Yep. So multi-kernels, an idea uh, that was sort of created by the Barrelfish and Factored OS um, teams who were building research operating systems that were trying to run on systems that had tens or hundreds or even thousands of cores. Uh, they were motivated by trying to get rid of um, locks, essentially. That's the main principle. Uh, yeah, and this came at a time when people were expecting that we would have uh, you know, thousands of cores within our computers within like 10 years or so, back in 2007. They didn't really work out. But uh, yeah, we found another interesting use for the architecture. So the general principle is that you uh, treat a modern computer as analogous to uh, a network of older computers. So each of the cores runs individually and separately, and there's a, a message passing layer, which is implemented in uh, shared memory, that allows the cores to talk to each other. You have uh, one core, sorry, one kernel per core, and the, the memory address spaces are uh, disjoint, so they can't access each other's memory. Yeah. So um, generally, we try and avoid locks by uh, duplicating OS state uh, and then negotiating when required. So the whole idea is that each node would essentially run as if it were uh, alone and talking over a network to other computers and sharing important information about that. Um, yeah, we use message passing rather than uh, shared memory, again, to try and get rid of locks. Uh, and we use, uh, 
yeah, solutions from the distributed uh, systems world to try and solve operating system projects at, at scale. Sorry, operating system problems that occur at scale. That's the right. So the project, as you can see, it, it works. This is an Erlang program you're looking at. Um, yep, it it can run arbitrary uh, Erlang programs without much problem, we have pretty good compatibility. Um, there's a solid amount of uh, device drivers, which do things like beeping and uh, you know, console cursor, that sort of stuff. Um, and a couple of other features that I'll go into more in more detail later, but a multi-unikernel system, which essentially allows you to host unikernels in your system without a hypervisor, and also a capabilities system, which allows you to uh, stop processes doing things that you don't want them to do. So you can run things in sort of quasi-sandbox mode. OK, so the system is designed uh, essentially with a virtual network of cores. Each core runs a beam, and uh, we do message passing by each uh, core, sorry, each, each node exposing uh, a small yeah, a reasonably sized um, message buffer that you can other cores can write into, and then it'll pick those messages up and distribute them to the correct process within the node. Um, yeah, and all program code is uh, executed in the Beam environment. There is no, there are no BIFs available to um, users of the system, and there's a reason for that, which we'll get into later. OK, so why do we use Erlang? Well, Erlang maps really well onto what we were trying to build. Erlang uses or has first, pass, uh, sorry, first class message passing. That's, that's the sort of general principle, which maps perfectly to our model. Um, yeah, and also the beam itself kind of resembles an operating system. It does process management, scheduling, uh, memory management, this sort of stuff. So now we're going to look at uh, how it works under the hood. So there are basically six major components to the system. Um, the bootloader, the C standard library, which provides us with uh, like a, a very minimal Unix-ish env Unix environment that just allows us to run the beam. Uh, and then some BIFs that allow us to interact with hardware, so port, I.O., this sort of stuff. Um, and then OS subsystems and drivers on top of that. And those last two are, are all Erlang. OK, so the bootloader. Basically, we found that we needed a new bootloader when we were building the system because we needed to load not one kernel into memory, but n kernels, where n is the number of cores you have, and also to distribute them correctly through memory. Uh, and set up page tables so that they are, or they believe that they are running in their own single address space. And that led us to, to an interesting problem, which was basically that BIOSes come with good support for reading from whatever b medium uh, the system is booted from. So in this case, on this machine, uh, that's from a USB stick. And if we wanted to, uh, well, yeah, I'll go into that in a second. Um, and in 16-bit mode, you can only access the first two megabytes of RAM. Uh, and our kernel is eight megabytes. And we would like to avoid uh, duplicating work, if possible. And also, uh, because all of our drivers are written in Erlang, we don't want to write a C driver to access uh, USB sticks and then have to rewrite that later in Erlang. So the, the solution to this essentially came from embracing the multi-core nature of our target machines. And basically what we do is we boot a, the first core into 64-bit mode, where uh, it can access all memory, but not the BIOS routines. Um, and then we boot a second core, which we keep in 16-bit mode, and we uh, get those two cores to communicate and cooperatively load the system 
into memory. So the first core will copy parts of the system into high memory, and the second core will uh, read parts of the disk into low memory, and it sort of cooperatively loads the whole system, which is kind of interesting. Um, so the C standard library that we're using is bespoke as well. Um, well, well, that's not quite true. Basically, what we did was we got the beam and we, uh, yeah, we tried to get it to compile in a system that had no standard library at all, and then went through adding the headers that were required from GNU libc uh, just to make it compile. Then we looked at the uh, the functions that were required and implemented stubs or a macro that made stubs for us. Then we went through and made yeah 180 stubs so that the system would compile. Then we ran the system, and every time we encountered a uh, yeah a stub being called, we would go and we would implement that stub function, and then, yeah, so net, then we had a system that would boot. And it turned out that actually you only need about 24 functions in order to get the beam to load and start executing code, which is kind of interesting. So the entire standard library, which essentially represents the Unix-like part of our system is 84, 83 kilobytes, which is interesting. And yeah, we were also trying to keep this absolutely minimal because it's much harder to recover from errors in the uh, C part of the system than in the Erlang part of the system. So that was one of the main principles we developed, which is basically pushing as much of the functionality up into Erlang where we can easily monitor things as we can. So next up is the beam. And essentially, we tried to leave it as much as possible um, vanilla. So yeah, most of the deviations that we had to create were just uh, edits to the config.h file, which is nice because that allows you to get rid of huge parts of the system that uh, aren't necessary. Yeah, we had to add a few things for um, interrupt handling, for example. So there have to be entry points in the system for interrupts to uh, go to when they're called. And these essentially all point back to a little bit of C code, which sends off a message to uh, an Erlang uh, server, which is, yeah, which then distributes the message or the interrupts out to the appropriate uh, listener. And that's how, for example, keyboard works. So when I press space, it, yeah. Right. So the OS services are written completely in Erlang, um, and they communicate with the hardware through a very small uh, set of BIFs. I think it's four, in fact, um, which really just do raw memory reading and writing and then port I.O. It's, it's, not, it's not very uh, large. Yeah, and we do device driver management and also uh, topology management. So we try and work out what the state of the machine is at, at all times and keep that locally. And that's um, yeah, that's a that's a per node thing. So each node has its own vision of what the system really looks like. Um, yeah, and we also monitor other nodes. And uh, obviously, when they fail, they can't restart themselves. So or most of the time they can't restart themselves, so we, uh, yeah, we restart them from others. And we do something kind of interesting there, which is we detect node failure not by just pinging it, and if we don't get a pong or a few times, then, then we'll restart it. Instead, what we do is send it a function, which it can then execute and then return a response to the sender. And this is kind of useful because in that function we can uh, do arbitrary computation that stretches and stresses the operating system so that we can detect whether it's in a sane state or not. So for example, we spawn a process, we do some uh, floating point arithmetic, or not, yes, yeah, I think we do, and then we send the message back. So if you get a response to one of these sanity check messages, it essentially means that the operating system is not just running something, but it also schedules and it can also do arithmetic and those sorts of things that you really want an operating system to be able to do. Um, yeah. We also have a concurrent init system, which uses an interesting algorithm that essentially uh, pushes all the planning onto the scheduler. So we just spawn a bunch of processes 
and the uh, yeah the the process or the the init goals that don't require don't have any sub requirements execute because they can and then messages are sent to other uh, processes that are listening for that goal completing, and then the sort of tree collapses on itself, which is kind of nice. Um, and there's also a basic Erlang shell, which you might have seen me playing around with earlier if you were in the room. Yeah, so the, drive in the drivers in the system uh, handle all sorts of timers, and uh, yeah, the PICs, which are the programmable interrupt controllers, and these are the quite important in our system because uh, the IO APIC, or global APIC, which is an advanced programmable interrupt controller, uh, controls routing of interrupts. So we use this to send signals to the correct node in the system, or all the nodes in the system. We can uh, set it up as we like. Yep, do keyboard, cursor control, um, console as well. And uh, we can also read tables, like the system management BIOS tables, PCI configuration space, those sorts of things we have uh, reasonable good, reasonably good support for. Uh, and next up is an Ethernet driver so that we can expand the system out onto a network and see see what it's like uh, when it can talk to other Hydros nodes. Right, so there are essentially three layers in our system. The kernel layer, which is written in C, uh, the local Erlang node or local Beam OS node layer, which is written in Erlang, and the global layer, which is written in Erlang 2. And the general idea is that we push as much work as we can from the kernel layer, which it's much harder to recover from, uh, from failures in, to the Erlang layers. Um, and so we keep the code minimal and terse with the, uh, the kernel and the bootloader. We try and yeah, minimize that. And then at the local OS layer, we found something kind of interesting, which was that uh, oh, these, are, these are processes that have to be, or systems that have to be duplicated for every node in the operating system or, or within the machine. So this is stuff like uh, capabilities management. There's a server that looks for that and those sorts of things. Uh, and also inter-process communication servers that handle the mailboxes for each node. Uh, and in these cases, we found that you actually have to embrace serial execution and shared memory, because otherwise you get huge latency. So if every time you spawn a node, uh, sorry, a process in our system, an entry is made into uh, the capabilities system that says, you know, it can do these things, can't do those things. And if we do this by message passing, then you end up with you know, potentially multiple round trips of all the processes in your system or on your node being scheduled, which is very long and, and it's latency that we can't afford when spawning processes. So the, we ended up having to uh, use ETS tables to store this kind of data, but it, but it works fine because there's no concurrent execution on a single node, which is kind of interesting. So the final layer, one sec, is the global layer. This is for services that are exposed uh, to all programs from all nodes, and you don't care where the processes are placed. That's down to the uh, the spawn utility, and they don't have any shared memory. This is sort of your normal Erlang model of. Uh, programming, and this is also where almost all user programs would go. Right, so one of the things we were looking at is because we um, because we run only Beam code in our or Beam code um, from users, we we have this opportunity to have much finer grained control over the execution of programs in our environment, because every single instruction has to go through the uh, Beam VM, which we can interrupt and, and check whether uh, certain things are allowed or not. And, sorry. Um, yeah, and this, this is slightly unrelated, but kind of 
interesting, I think. We use this system to uh, essentially create resilience to bugs within the beam itself. And basically, if you if you were running, if a process was running a BIF that is accessible from the uh, system layer, and that BIF happened to uh, cause a general protection fault and try and um, access some memory that it didn't have access to, normally on a Linux computer, this would cause the beam to uh, die, and you would have to you know restart and that sort of thing. But because of this system, we're able to uh, catch the interrupt and kill the process that caused that uh, bit of the beam code to be run and then continue execution with the other processes, which is rather nice. Right, so the capabilities system in the operating system allows you to uh, provide fine-grained controls over what a process and its uh, sub-process or children processes can and cannot execute. So you start the the first the root node in the system starts with an empty list for its capabilities and it's an exclusion list so this means it can do everything and then when you spawn extra processes you can uh, choose to provide some capabilities that that process should not be able to do or or you can keep with the default which is just the process the capabilities of the parent process and this essentially allows you to start trees of um processes which have fewer um, capabilities than their parents. So if you had a, a program that you weren't sure whether it was malicious or not, you could spawn it with none of the capabilities that allow it to talk to the outside world or write to disk or even uh, message processes uh, outside the node, this sort of stuff. And you could be sure that it would run and it, it wouldn't be able to harm your computer, which is nice. And we also... Um, yeah, we also use this for drivers and things. And you can essentially provide a sort of defensive layer if you, if you want to. Uh, if you have a driver that you're not sure of the quality, you can work out what, uh, what capabilities that driver requires and then cut down all of the uh, other accesses in the system so that it can only access the two I.O. ports it needs in order to do its job. And this means that if it, if it goes AWOL or errant, then it, it can't harm the rest of the system, which is nice. Um, yeah, the control scheme for this is deliberately very, very minimal at the moment. You can't add uh, processes higher up the tree, can't give capabilities back to sub-processes at the moment. And there are a few other things like this. Uh, but the, the idea here generally is to keep the attack surface small. So the neater and smaller it is, the less likely you are you're going to find a uh, a way into the, or around the capability system. Right. Um, so another feature we have in the operating system is um, sorry, just checking the time. Unikernels or multi unikernels rather, but I'll first explain quickly what a unikernel is. So unikernels are essentially compiled programs or programs that are compiled into operating system images that can run without, um, without aid of another operating system underneath it. So they're normally used in hypervisor environments to cut down the size of your uh, deployable image and also cut out unnecessary OS services that uh, might expose you to security holes. So this is quite nice because you know, if a hacker was able to get hold into a, say, Mirage OS OCaml um, program, they, they have no shell with which they can attack the rest of the system. So in our system, we built a thing called multi-unikernels, which fits very well with the multi-kernel model in that essentially each kernel on each core is independent so we can replace some would-be Erlang or Beam nodes with uh, user-made uh, unikernels. And, this allows, and these kernels run outside of a hypervisor, unlike uh, normal unikernel environments, which means there's less interruption. You get entire access to the CPU, and you're never interrupted. So it can be very, very fast. Yeah, and and 
another kind of interesting thing we're looking at doing with this, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> and again, um, is potentially creating what we call a sub-OS model, where you can load an operating system on its own onto one of these nodes, and it runs side by side with your Erlang nodes, and then you can use the device drivers provided by this operating system within your Hydros system. And this is, you know, for systems in the future, perhaps, where there's hundreds of cores. So giving away one core to run, you know, NetBSD or whatever uh, is no problem. And so these multi-uni kernels can communicate with each other through the normal message passing uh, system that the rest of the um, yeah, the rest of the Hydro system uses, and they can talk to one another rather than through an Erlang node necessarily. So you can make interesting systems where, uh, for example, maybe a unikernel has direct access to the uh, network interface card and handles requests for you, filtering some that uh, need a lot of data processing that, and sending those to a unikernel, which does that processing and sending others to Erlang nodes that might do HTTP handling and that sort of stuff. Right, so next up, we're going to um, yeah, find a way of uh, emulating or, or at least triggering realistic CPU core failure. This is, this is a big problem for us because we're, we're quite sure that our system will handle this but without a good way of testing it in realistic conditions. Uh, it's hard to be sure. Yep, and another thing is expanding the model out onto the network. So making uh, sort of meta Hydra systems, which allow uh, subnodes to communicate with others in, in the system. And yeah, we also have two um, undergrad students this year one of whom is going to uh, look at building a distributed file system for the operating system, another that's going to look at making a concurrent GUI so that I don't have to present with uh, this interesting text-based interface. Um, yeah, and one interesting thing we're looking at doing with the uh, networking is getting programmable network interface cards that, uh, that we give kernels or, or, or programs that uh, can access the message out boxes for each uh, node in the system and then hoover up these messages, send them out across the network without the core having to do any, uh, any sort of interaction with the network interface card itself. And we can do this because PCI devices have DMA or direct memory access. So. So the operating system is available from hydros-project.org. Uh, you can run it. It runs in Box, QMU, uh, KVM, and Zen, and probably a lot of other things. It doesn't run in VirtualBox at the moment. Uh, you can also use it on real hardware, like I'm doing here. Uh, it runs on all the systems we've used, uh, but you might have a problem with getting it to boot off a USB device, like I did today. Uh, which you can just use grub and chain load for if that's a problem. Yeah, and you can also download the source and compile it yourself and, and edit. You know, uh, it'd be interesting to see what, what people what people do with it. Um, yeah, so thank you. We questions? Have time for questions. Um, how's your interrupt queue implemented? How do uh, does that become an Erlang message? Yes, it does at the moment, and there are major problems there that we're going say, to have is to. The message <laughs> queue bounded, or <laughs> yeah, we precise. Well, of course, uh, it's not infinite. Um, and also another problem that we're looking at is uh, level triggered interrupts rather than edge triggered. So our interrupt handlers run at the moment and they'll send a message and then they'll deassert the interrupt and, and wait and wait for another and allow 
execution to happen, which is where the actual interrupt handling happens in the Erlang part of the system, but with uh, some sorts of interrupts called uh, level uh, asserted, they won't deassert when you tell them to, so they'll just trigger another interrupt again and again and again until it actually has you know whatever the device driver wanted to happen or whatever the device needs to happen to happen so so that's something we've got to look at so I'm wondering if there's any like uh, potential upstream changes to Erlang based on your experiences in this? No, and that's a good thing. We, we are trying to keep compatibility with the beam. So we, we try and keep uh, as many changes as we can outside of the system. Uh, so that essentially at some point you should be able to plug a, a desktop you know, Linux machine into a Hydros system and they will work together and they can distribute work and those sorts of things. So we're actively trying to avoid editing the beam as much as possible. Um, but I suppose one thing we are doing is implementing some things that were written in BIFs in Erlang back into Erlang. So there's a sort of weird standard library that of uh, Erlang implemented um, things that used to be in BIFs. So if anyone is interested in that, they can let me know, and I'll give them a copy. Well, uh, can uh, can you sort of migrate applications between cores and uh, or, or du that applications duplicate themselves and well do, do strange things like that? So process mobility is that your yeah? Uh, there is no process mobility at the moment. Um, but there was some work by a, uh, a master's student uh, from, I forget where, I'm afraid. Uh, but they implemented a process mobility system that we're likely to look at when we're implementing ours. Generally, the idea at the moment is generate uh, short-lived processes and then they're scheduled or they're positioned sensibly and, and yeah, node utilization stays sensible. But that is definitely a problem because we don't have the beam on multi-core, so yeah, we can't just shift them from run queue to another, or from one run queue to another. Anything else? More questions? Nope. So okay. Let's thank the speaker. Thanks. <laughs>